Okay, now we're recording. Uh, one more minute, okay? Let's wait until two more minutes. Sorry. We can now uh, sort of get in our posture. <clears throat> and then I'm going to transfer direction. The umze. Okay. <clears throat> Is that too close? No, you can see everything that way. Okay. All right. Well, let's give it a start. Good evening, everybody. Thank you once again for um, allowing me to, to come chat with you. Um, get started first with a little bit of meditation and some opening uh, chants. Um, so forgive me if um, I kind of barrel through this, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm not used to you, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not really sure uh, what works best for you. So um, uh, well, It was fine the way you did it. I would just say the, the dedication, we always do that a little bit slow paced hmm. because it really like we really feel like we're sending it out, and, hmm. you know, in a way that uh, they're not used to the mantras. And always having that uh, right. application bodhicitta and things like that. So that's why we just started doing it slow. But aside from that, I think it was perfect. Okay. Well, here we go. I mean, it's still perfect, yeah. This is the refuge in Bodhicitta. 
Namo Kuncho Sanan Same Sung Yap Name Namya Jatsuchi Dukun Sanjay Lachuji Chancho Judu Samke Tu Namo Kuncho Sanan Same Sung Yap Name Namya Jatsuchi Dukun Sanjay Lachuji Chancho Judu Samke Tu Namo Kuncho Sanan Same Sung Yap Name Namya Jatsuchi Dukun Sanjay
BR. Tip, I usually do three juiceries before the text. I forgot that this morning. Amara <laughs> Basanati. And the D D D D. D D D D D. Mara Basanati. Um Mara Basanati. Um Mara Basanati. Thank you, Yashi. So good evening once again. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah? Okay. Um, so this evening I wanted to share um, a little bit from the flight of the Garuda with you. This book had a special meaning for me. Um, the first time it came into my possession was um, in the early 2000s and um, I was I was just finishing second year and um, uh, at retreat and um, um, I was eager to get my hands on a lot of things and I dove into the first couple chapters and it felt like I hadn't read anything. Um, and I thought that was so strange. I was reading the words and I knew what, I knew what the English meant and I knew what the words meant, but none of it was making sense. And then um, several years later, um, I did the full four week retreat, which was then um, fifth year, which was the introduction to Chukchur um, and when I came home from retreat, I picked up the flight of the Garuda then, and all of a sudden it just opened up like a beautiful flower. And it turns out it was a teaching on structure. And that's what is often meant by, uh, when a teaching is self secret, um, you can read it and you can read it. And, you know, if you, if you're not ready for it, it just doesn't make sense. And that's exactly what had happened to me. So this book really informed everything that I had done in fifth year, uh, the entire practice, and it added so much dimension and so much flavor to my practice. So I thought I'd just share a little bit with you. Um, and to that end, um, I'll start at the starting point, initiation. <laughs> so the introduction is structured according to the traditional triadic format of the starting point or ground, path and goal. In Dzogchen, the starting point is the path, the path is the goal, and the goal is the starting point. Go, uh, Keith Diamond, sorry. They're familiar with the word fruit, taking the fruit as the yeah. path. Yeah. So when he says goal, remember fruit <laughs> if the mind is dull or meditation unusually bleak a predictable response to that statement may be since there is nowhere to go and nothing to do what is the purpose of zokchen and why practice any form of yoga the starting point is the fruit refers to the unchanged form of awareness the forms that arise are the same as ever the difference lies in the all-important detachment from these forms and the cessation of grasping and clinging. The purpose of, of Dzogchen is to bring the aspirant to recognition of what is obvious as daylight, and the blinders to recognition are attachment to the twin veil of emotion and intellect. With a modicum of detachment, it becomes evident what happens to emotion and thought. They may not disappear, but there is a radical transforma transformation of quality and motivation becomes that of the bodhisattva vow. Thus, although there may be no striving toward a bodhisattva's mind state, there is a spontaneous evolution towards it. However, in a state of ignorance, how do we meditate with detachment? If nothing is to be done, if nothing can be done, because all effort is derived from counterproductive attachment, how can we break the continuum of ignorance? The answer is initiation. Initiation by direct introduction to the nature of mind. The initiation induces the state of mind that breaks the vicious circle 
of moral and mental cause and effect, replacing horizontal rational thought processes with a vertical creative news Dakini inspired infusion of primal awareness. Dang. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> Getting vertical. <laughs> meditation upon that state, formless meditation, deconditions consciousness, leaving the original existential condition to arise spontaneously, moment by moment. We are still not out of the woods, though. If initiation is understood as an enlightenment experience, how can this spontaneous event be induced? It is simply a matter of formal initiation. This problem should not be glossed over. What error to mistake formal initiation for a real initiatory experience upon which meditation can be based? Initiation implies discovery of the real Buddha, Lama, in distinction to a human perceptor, and seeking precludes finding. The basis of Dzogchen achievement is not attained without initiation. Initiation is the function of the Lama, and the Lama is a state of a causal primal awareness. The Indian Mahasiddha Naropa and the indomitable, with his unflaking quest for the un unfindable representation by his Guru Tilopa, is the exemplar of this situation. Without experiencing initiation, we must practice preliminary techniques and the tractor medications, meditations described in the Dzogchen. So finely honed by generations of yogic experiment in the laboratory of the mind that inevitably they bring quick results. They prepare the mind for initiation and initiatory experience can arise during practice of them. The mainstream Dzogchen schools, the Nintik lineages, for example, do not teach the uncompromising dogma of sudden liberation, the doctrine that implies that futility of attempting to condition the relative mind to an absolute reality. Going beyond uh, spacious, spacious uh, argument, there is commitment to a middle path of absolute rel relativity. Can you... Um... Because it's so so content heavy. Yeah, maybe. Are there any co comments or questions so far on that? You guys just absorbing. Could could you maybe reread that last sentence? Sorry. Was... The mainstream Dzogchen schools of Ningtit lineages, for example, do not teach the uncompromising dogma of sudden liberation, the doctrine that implies the futility of attempting to condition the relative mind to an absolute reality. Going beyond specious argument, there is commitment to a middle path of absolute relativity. Specious? Specious. What does that mean? Like special, a special argument. Oh. So absolute reality in which the aspirant is included to accept intuitively Buddhahood is here and now. Yeah, so just for clarification, he, he's talking about how trying and effort and creating and manifesting conditioning um, is futile, you know, that... Um, it's it, actually just simple. Yeah, that it's already there unconditioned and and our efforts can actually begin to corrupt that, right? We've We've heard that theme before. Now the striving and the Lama that is referred to here is the is the inner Lama. The it's not some something external. It's it's your own inner teacher, if you will, uh, your own primordial nature. So, more? Oh yeah, I think everybody's hanging in there. Okay. <laughs> but if you feel like I forgot that too sorry i'm a little sloppy with this stuff but um when you when you feel the content has reached a point where is everybody still in there you know you can stop for mm -hmm. comments or questions okay no, if you feel it right i didn't mean to interrupt you i'm sorry no worries, no worries. <laughs> okay. in practice consideration of the dichotomy of sudden and gradual enlightenment should not enter the mind while at the same time the aspirant practices on the graduated path, 
that may lead to the pith meditations of the flight of the Garuda, but service to sentient beings, generosity, regular offerings of flowers in the temple, prostrations, visualizations, and mantra are all skillful means to the attainment of Dzogchen, and any of them can provide the psychic environment in which initiation or sudden liberation into one's true condition is achieved. Furthermore, such practices generate vital merit, credit in the karmic bank, if you will. On this path, the mind may be reconditioned by replacing useless, confused thought processes with merit-generating processes that induce the requisite susceptibility to the Lama's blessings. Premonition of initiation and the ground of initiation is cultivated thereby. The nature of the ground of initiation can best be understood by inducing the basic concepts and meditations that the Buddha Shakyamuni taught. It may appear at times that Tantra in general and Dzogchen in particular are far divorced from the teachings of early Buddhism. On the contrary, it is assumed that the fundamental truisms contained in the Four Noble Truths form the bedrock of the aspirant's mentality, suffering as the nature of existence, desire as the principal human drive, nirvana is the only human goal worthy of aspiration, detachment as the path to happiness. Any progress towards eradication, neutralization, transformation, or full awareness of the twin veil of emotion and mental concepts can prepare the ground for initiation. So just to put that in a tweet, um, they're basically talking about supplementing the thought proliferation with like merit generating things like making offerings and doing mantras and um, so that you can come closer in that way. You know, it is sort of complements Dzogchen uh, to supplement that, substitute that sort of uh, idle um, <laughs> thought, right, with something virtuous. And, we, and that ties in also, by the way, to the Eightfold Path of uh, right, right speech, right action, all that sort of stuff, you know. So in other words, what he's... What... What is meant also here you know, to kind of dovetail onto that thought is, you know, we've we've kind of pre-programmed ourselves with a lot of discursiveness and and stuff, if you will, and basically the preliminary practices are kind of like reformatting your hard drive. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, pardon me, I'm a computer scientist, so, <laughs> <laughs> so. they're all techies too, so I'm sure it resonates. <laughs> so, so you're basically reformatting your hard drive and you're putting some different content on it, and so, yeah. but that's only it shouldn't be mistaken for what you're ultimately doing. It's yeah. just. Just okay. compliments. Yeah, compliments. It basically gets gets things going so that you can eventually launch the real program. Yeah. So. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> you so, guys good? Yeah? Yeah. I'll thinking in. Okay. Discursive contemplation derived from the Four Noble Truths discussed in the following paragraphs can be highly efficacious in establishing a receptive attitude to the Lama. When such analysis is understood experientially, the roots of desire and suffering are severed. If our attachment to thought forms can be decreased, gaps in our slavish obedience to the mind's <laughs> rationale dictates leave space for the Lama to make himself known. Damn, okay, hold on. <laughs> I'm starting to lay down a little bit more now. <laughs> But, you know, they're talking about pointing out instructions, right? They're saying that if you can calm your mind the fuck down a little bit, you'll get to pointing out instructions. Exactly. <laughs> you'll, okay. you'll be receptive to them. We've seen that millions of times here. Some people, including ourselves, are just too discursive. Our mind's jumping or we're just caught up in those thoughts and emotions so heavily that we cannot re recognize awareness. Right? We just sort of, then we think shit about awareness. We're like, oh, awareness, oh, it's this and that, and da, da, da. Now I have awareness. I'm special, and, you know, and all this stuff, you know, the add ons. 
so this is really um, sort of explicitly in the context of how one would prepare for the pointing out instructions and then receive those from, uh, from somebody who has already gained that recognition or that realization. Yeah. Since much neurotic or uncontrollable thought is provoked by fear or insecurities, sometimes arise in the most outrageous thought forms, fear can be reduced by quieting anxiety about the nature of existence and the purpose of life. Experiential understanding teams our mundane hopes and fears about food, shelter, and clothing, and the eight worldly obsessions, all the rubbish of the mind. The following questions and answers are the Buddha Shakyamuni's own. The Four Noble Truths arose out of these questions on the nature of existence and reality. The primary question is, what is the principal attribute of existence? Answer, suffering. The First Noble Truth. The second question is, what is the cause of suffering? Answer, desire. The Second Noble Truth. The answer to the first question is reached by equating existence with suffering. Existence consists of birth, sickness, old age, and death. Existence is sustained on every level by desire, desire including its antithesis and, and con commitment and attachment and clinging is a dynamic of existence. Any taste of true happiness that we achieve in existence is the result of the cessation of attachment. Happiness is not non-existence since it's the same situation, birth, sickness, etc. still arise, and it is not existence because the quality of happiness is unending, empty, blissful awareness. If happiness does not possess these attributes, it is not the Buddha's happiness, but rather a lesser degree of suffering in which attachment is still operative. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thus, in the Buddhist terms, the happiness of the gods is not true happiness because attachment as fear of eventual loss of divinity through death works in the gods' minds like a canker conceived in the spring of seeming contentment to mature in a winter of bile and gall. This <laughs> Oh, I've God. never heard Dalman before. So this is just, I'm sorry. I'm not used to this to, to, to nomenclature being applied here. <laughs> if you've ever, I've actually received teachings from Dalman directly, and he's he's uh, he's very proper. He's very English, and he speaks like this. And he slangs them words around. Uh, yeah, I mean, this, is, this is how he talks. Uh, as a poet, I, I'm appreciating. Yeah, are there comments or questions? No, I wanted to say it kind of reminds me of like if you've ever read The Lord of the Rings, the way he sometimes he, it's like very uh, yeah, kind of sublime explanations for things. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting that old school vocabulary vibe, but I'm liking it. It's it's pretty <laughs> gangster actually. <laughs> so, um, yeah, as long as everybody's you know everything's got to be applicable. If something isn't relating to you, please ask about it, you know, um, especially with my mom here, uh, you may get that clarification that you need and uh, don't let any of this go over your head or be foreign. That's all I'm asking. Okay. Yeah. So, suffering is failure to get what we want. Suffering is getting what we want, but we do not want. Suffering is fear of loss. Suffering is losing what we have. After obtaining our desires, we suffer the pride of possession. We suffer jealousy if someone else has what we want or something better than we have. In all these situations, desire and grasping are the cause of our suffering. To take sexual desire, one universal desire, as an example, we suffer pangs of desire. We suffer the anguish of longing. We suffer unsatisfied lust. We suffer selfish satisfaction. We suffer loss and lust's aftermath. We suffer loss of the object or of, of desire. We suffer the perversions of desire. We suffer uninformed adolescent desire, the frustrations of mature desire, and the rage of impotent desire. We suffer lovesickness, falling out of love, and all the neuroses of love and desire, and we suffer sexually transmitted diseases. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Jesus. 
<laughs> like that add-on right there. Fire. And oh, by the way, <laughs> it's going to cause you all this trouble. And, and you're herpes. Gonna make it, and you're going <laughs> <make it. laughs> to be sad with herpes. <laughs> Damn. So just ditch it. <laughs> so there's some form of pain involved in every stage of sexual desire. Indeed. Love and desire are all suffering unless unless and until there is detachment from this desire. Whatever of the Buddha's happiness there is in desire and in its corollary, love, is the result of trend, the transcendence of desire, a state obtained through eradication, neutralization, or intensification of passion. The third and fourth noble truths are the truths of cessation of desire, nirvana. And the truth of the path to cessation, which is practic practical experience of Buddha Dharma, particularly Dzogchen precepts. The yogin is separated from those who have no knowledge of the Four Noble Truths by the, his conviction that happiness has nothing to do with satiation of desire. My karmic propensity by the grace of a teacher, by fortuitous revelations or insight, he has seen that nothing so if you're an uh, ephemeral is desire fulfilled is worth the striving. Life is short. Death is always at hand. The potential of the human being is far too great to waste on simple psychological, sensual, or physical gratifications. He must have had the vision of the greater existential potential, a vision partaken of by yogins, saints, seers, and sages in every part of the world since time began. His definition of happiness begins at the freedom from desire. And what remains after desire no longer directs his body, speech, and mind. Simple but pure sensory perception. Such was the Buddhist Sakyamuni's insight. Virtually the entire Buddhist canon, both Sutra and Tantra, is concerned in some way with the mechanics of desire and of sensory perception the part played out by ethics and behavioral discipline, and particularly the Mahayana by selfless giving, which arises simultaneously with the attainment of the primordial awareness inherent in unobstructed sensual perception. To comprehend the sophistication and complexity of the various solutions to the problem, that it is its bold, unadorned, inter uh, interrogative forms seems to be a simple psychological problem but which upon investigation turns into an insoluble labyrinth, enigma. We need only look at the mandalas, mantras, and metaphysical equations that constitute a root tantra. Such is the complexity of the mind, and it is in all the answers to the questions of how to sustain pure sensory perception, unclouded by thought and emotion. Maybe come to a stopping point mm -hmm. when you're ready. Let's see. We're almost done with initiation. Really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's go all the way. You guys are cool? Yeah. yeah. Sensory perception begins at the moment of birth and continues every moment until death. And sleep, our senses are, um, are internalized in the dream. What is the constant in the sensory process? It can only be the absolute element of being. Some Hindus called it and I'm going to butcher this, so my apologies. Mm. Satchita Nanda, truth, consciousness, and bliss. In Buddhism, since this constant cannot be located or specified in any way, it is called shunyata, emptiness. <clears throat> Wait a minute. Um, is that Keith Dalman's words right there? That's not the from the Yeshe Lama. No, this is not from the Yeshua Lama. This is different. It's Dalman's actual. Okay, because we don't draw that dichotomy here between Hinduism and Buddhism. The It's all Dharma. Um, so, um, can you read that again? And we can sort of tie it into the context. Well, I think the context becomes clear in, in the next sentence. So. Okay. Sensory perceptions begins at the moment of birth. I'll repeat it. And continues every moment until death. And sleep, our senses are... Um, interrogized in dream. What is the constant with these sensory processes? It can only be the absolute element of being. Some Hindus call it 
Shitananda, truth, consciousness, and bliss. In Buddhism, since this constant cannot be located or specified in any way, it is called shunyata, em emptiness. This emptiness, which can also be conceived as a fullness, is synonymous with thatness, the nature of mind, the womb of Buddhahood and reality. There is no trace of world denial in the Buddhist tantric view of life. Emptiness does not exist if it can be said to exist at all, as an independent entity. It is best described as all-pervasive, all-penetrating, and there is nothing that it excludes. Further, since it is identified with the nature of mind, one's detachment is achieved. Um, once attach detachment is achieved, it is within emptiness that the yogin identifies and identifying with emptiness he identifies with the nature of all things. In this way, the Buddha's omniscience and omnipotence are a function of simple sensory perception and simple pure sensory perception is the starting point and the goal. The ground of initiation is laid by absorption of this vision and by any innumerable techniques of meditation that facilitate it. The primal awareness, the pure Gnostic awareness of sensory perception that is the starting point in the goal is also the initiation. I have already defined initiation as the enlightenment experience that is conditioned sin qua non, a finding, that, uh, finding the Buddha Lama. The Buddha Lama is the agent of the initiation. After initiation, the practice of maintaining constant union with him is the essential Dzogchen discipline. Upon initiation, both relative and absolute pledges, the samaya, are sworn. The relative pledges of body, speech, and mind support the yogin in this action, speech, and samadhi. While his central practice is to condition his being in maintaining the constant primal awareness inherent in each moment of perception until the vision is irre irrevocable, is, is the norm. Irrevocable. So you can't revoke it. Oh, irrevocable. Irrevocable, yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's initiation. All right. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, I normally wouldn't jump in on you so many times, but you no, know, it's fine. it's just um, you know, the the Hinduism Buddhism thing is a, a western academia sort of invention that uh, i don't follow that for example varupa started uh, the he's a founder of the sakya lineage in buddhism as well as the hatha yoga lineage in yoga but also revered in so many so-called hindu so uh you, you already know this uh, you guys might have a clue because i repeat this quite often but if you could if you want to not be sectarian and divisive then we could say so-called Hinduism, so-called Buddhism, because we can actually now rewind that divisive sort of uh, nomenclature and and really tie Dharma together, because that's just one example of Rupa. He's a, he's a Mahasiddhi revered in so-called Hinduism and in so-called Buddhism, which I call Dharma. It's all Dharma, right? Because when it was migrating from India... Um, the these guys like Saraha and Varupa um, were instrumental in, in founding these schools, right? The first Hatha Yoga text ever was um, formed by Varupa, the ugly one, who, by the way, was black, who was a person of color. And I've seen him even get lighter in some depictions, you know? <laughs> so that's bullshit. But, you know, he... He was known as being dark colored, dark skinned, and I think we should celebrate that. And we should also celebrate the fact that they're not divided. So, um, what the, the so what he's referring there to is a misunderstanding for such a smart guy. Uh, I know I'm nothing compared to Keith Dalman, but I do know this that um, in Hinduism and and Buddhism, um, they're talking about the same shit. Just see Ramana Mahashri. Um, and, and these little semantic wars and, and divisions that we create based on semantics are not useful, you know. In fact, I'm I'm a little triggered by it <laughs> every time I hear it. You know? But it's okay. Uh, I just want to put that out there. I've always put that out there 
for you guys because uh, in Nyingma, we believe in tying things together and not dividing. That's the Nyingma tradition, non-political sort of unifying. You know, yeah, as you, my mom can, I can I say, and she's been a part of this Nyingma Palio lineage for a long time. So anyway, uh, that uh, sounded like you said shit that Yana or something like that, <laughs> whatever that word was, um, no disrespect intended. Uh, there's nowhere that says that they're positing a truly existent thing, like like Dalman uh, implicitly put down there. Um, actually, Shunyata is the same. They're, they were saying joy, bliss, and, and cognizance. That's also in the nature of mind. So no conflict there, actually. You know, I don't even know why that had to be brought up, why he had to put because everything was perfect and actually kind of exciting me until that. You know, <laughs> but anyway, um, now that we have that correction, any comments or questions? <laughs> Please go ahead, go cool. Because I assume yeah. you just shorter than mine. Yeah. Okay, go cool. Come on. Thank you so much for the transmission. It was really worth reading to the end. I loved it. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for letting me uh, share it with you. <laughs> oh, thank you. That helped make this possible that me and my mom are together. That's my homie right there, oh. my brother. <laughs> thank you. <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All of them are, but you know. Oh, yes, you the monkey saying her voice again. Don't get attached, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think you have such a beautiful candle there, Yes, <laughs> That thing is really remarkable. Yeah, it's if you guys lean towards Dalman, don't let me discourage you, okay? If I was blindfolded, I'd think you're talking. Yeah, we have the young genes. She actually looks very young, too. How old are you, Ma? 64. 64 years old. She don't look no 64. <laughs> My sister, too, is like that. <laughs> All right. You guys better be careful with this. Talking about my mom's stuff. <laughs> I'm going to come across this phone <laughs> in a minute. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. Uh... Mr. Brandon Jumpel, what's your, your comment or question? Oh, I wanted to ask. I think there was a sentence you read in maybe the second to last paragraph that started with something like, uh, the pure no, no, Gnostic awareness that is the entryway and fruition of the path. Would you be able to read that again? Let me try to find it for you. Let me see, okay. Oh, you have contacts. Yes, I've got right. contacts. I, was, I was thinking you don't have your glasses. No, I haven't worn glasses in a long time. I haven't been here in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, you know, as it, while she finds this, I just want to say that we know this awareness um, to us it started out very simple, right? We just talk about it like it's pretty ordinary here. Is it this sentence here? The primal awareness, the pure Gnostic awareness of sensory perception that is the starting point and the goal is also the initiation. Yeah, yeah. So if I could ask, is that kind of what you were talking about when you were talking about the, was it maybe the primordial guru? was the term you used? Yeah. Um, if I were to describe this, if I were to describe initiation in kind of a um, strategic point of view, I would say that because we're, we're bound by the confines of conceptual thought and language we have to use terms like goal and path and things like that even though they imply a going somewhere and 
initiation actually really is just about plowing the the field to allow what's already there to arise so it's so that's pretty much the gist of the whole thing is the lama is not something external even though you know we talk about the teachers and so on and so forth but what ends up happening when you are actually studying one-on-one -on -one with the Lama, that whole situation gets flipped and hmm. it becomes, you are actually your own teacher hmm. because the, the wisdom is within yourself, no other place. And the only thing that the Lama is actually doing is kind of giving you a jump start on, on, on getting past all these notions of goal and path and so on and so forth. Um, because we, we think we're going somewhere. And unfortunately, that's just the limitations of the language. We're not going anywhere. Mm. We're simply undoing, um, or as my daughter likes to say, we got to unfuck this shit. <laughs> <laughs> Daughter's also ex-military. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of the bottom line of it all, is that, you know, so so the doing that is often inferred in some of the texts and everything it's really not doing so I don't know if that makes sense, but... yeah, is, that, is that related to like the ordinary awareness thing or the I don't ordinary, know what the ordinary awareness? awareness thing is <laughs> my apologies uh, let, let, i'm just gonna jump in with my controversial opinions as always i feel like that was the one spot where he keeps being totally wrong. He keeps saying it's awareness going through sensory perception. Yeah. I feel like the nature of mind has nothing to do with sensory perception. Like our six doors, our six sensory sort of doors, um, are they become purified. There, well, according to all the texts, that's like the display of our mind mm. so these eyes these ears the tongue mm. everything why does it have awareness in it mm. you know they all have cognizance let's use the we always want to switch that word so we don't get hung up on one word too much mm -hmm. you know but why do they all have cognizance like when you feel something there's a knowingness there when you hear something there's a knowingness there mm. yeah there's cognizance so he's he's calling that sense perception yeah. awareness, which show, to me seems yeah. like he hadn't got it yet. I know that sounds a little <laughs> cocky, but to me that's wrong because awareness is like, I've never heard anybody else call it that in my life of reading books, mm -hmm. but you know, whatever, it's cool. Um, I'm just saying that awareness is like space. Toko, Oregon, many of them have said this over and over again. It's, compared to space for a reason, because it's space-like. So we move our hands through space. Well, we move our thoughts through awareness, our emotions through those four foundations of mindfulness, thoughts, emotions, body, and environment are all within awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So it's not as just uh, limited to sensory perceptions like it's being implied here. And... Um, yeah, I found, and what that wording, mom, I found that wording awkward as well. A little well. problematic. Mm -hmm. But mom's talking about that this awareness is your guru, that that your mind is the guru, is the lama, you know, this awareness. So you, like, you guys already know that, yeah? Huh? <laughs> would, a, would, a, would a word be like appearance intelligence? <laughs> appearance intelligence? for <laughs> A word for what? No. Um. Uh, you could call it donkey poop spongebob for all i care you know um but like i always say that word awareness refers to something you saw each one of you here had pointing out instructions you may have not even known that you're getting them when you got them and i think that's the way we need to do it these days because people have made a big hoopla about the nature of mind so it becomes unobtainium People think they can't reach it when you just spectacularize it all the time, you know, specialize it all the time, make it so special and unreachable. So they all got to pointing out instructions and what they, what you guys saw, we're just, we just point to it with that sound, those vibrations, those frequencies, 
awareness. It's just a sound that points to something you saw. Yeah? You can use any word you want. You don't need to get caught up on the words. Because what if we were all speaking Greek or Spanish? You know, or Russian? We'd be using different words. Yeah? The words are truly, um, like I always say, it's like a you have an iceberg and you have the tip of the iceberg and then everything else on the bottom. Awareness is a little rabbit turd on the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> it's not even the tip of the iceberg. It's a freaking where Dollar came along and pissed on a, on a spot. <laughs> you know, that's what it is, really. Not to sort of be disrespectful, but you know, we have to say we have to say that because you know we see all these debates about oh, awareness is not the nature of mind. Well, that's totally irrelevant. That word is just talking about something we saw. So the word sun has very little to do with that big old ball of light that we see. You know, it's not even the sun. What is that really? We call it the sun, but that's just a a name tag that we put on it. You know. You understand, B? It's at the top of the hour, so. Yeah. yeah. So any other uh, super potent questions? If, if anything else can wait till tomorrow or the next day, I'm going to be flying back tomorrow, so I should be able to make at least one session tomorrow. Um, but hopefully you guys will keep the nest open. Um, and then we have our guest star that we have to thank so much for today. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to. OK, so we'll close the session. Everybody's saying thank you. All right. So do this. Um, Of course, <laughs> being in this powerful Dharma room and um, doing the the bell, this beautiful singing bowl and then the silent meditation, including these sacred ancient mantras. And then the reading from this sacred ancient text by um, a longtime practitioner, we've generated immense amount of merit that we, um, and then clarifying the view also. So we dedicate that to uh, all sentient beings without exception. Gewa magen rodo konlano. Gewa magen rodo Gewa magen dodo kunlano. And thank you everybody so much. Thank you. Wow, the power session. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you disassemble. <laughs> so you guys good for the night? Everything all good? Huh? Mr. Yes, you're just turning into light over there. You got multiple orbs now. <laughs> yeah, everybody's all good. You guys go and get a nice rest, yeah? Hopefully get a good rest. Love you. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Mom. Take care. <laughs> That's my, my Buddha from another Muda right there. <laughs> I'm not going to stop saying that joke until everybody stops laughing. If I get, as long as I'm getting one laugh out of that joke, I'm going to keep on saying that. <laughs> no, I appreciate you guys so much. I actually invited a few other people and they're going to be mad that they missed it. Um, that's why I was joking about predicting, you know, um, they told me they would come, but karma didn't work out that way. So either way, I hope you all have a beautiful rest. And, man, you're always in my heart. So don't forget that. And stay strong, you know, until tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys.